Hi there, welcome to The Violin Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Mergala, where I talk to violinists from around the world. If we're meeting for the first time, thanks for joining us today. And if you haven't done so already, please be sure to check out the podcast notes for links to our social media pages, as well as subscribe to the podcast. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is a violinist, pedagogue, and entrepreneur. He is a producer of Spice Classics, the director of Overtone Artists, and he frequently writes on the topics of musical performance. Please let me welcome Daniel Kurganoff. Daniel, Really nice to meet you. Really glad that you're on the Violin Podcast this week. How are you? I'm I'm doing as fine as as uh, one could hope. And thank you very much for having me on. And it's a, it's a great project that that you're doing. Looking forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. So uh, before we get into the nitty gritty, I want to talk. Uh, I want I want you to share your story. I want you to talk to our audience who may or may not know you about you know where you come from, um, how you got started with the violin and how, how that journey kind of shaped where you are today. Sure. Um, so I have a, a slightly unique background with, with music and with the violin, at least. Um, I started piano when I was around six years old, but I only started violin when I was 16. And so that's kind of, it's been an interesting journey and it always continues to be interesting um you know when you start very late you have to come up with all sorts of solutions for yourself that others you know even great teachers that i came up uh that that i interacted with sometimes didn't know how to approach um my situation um so that was very interesting but i guess to start I'll give you like a, a brief overview um so I was born in, in Minsk in Belarus with the former Soviet Union. And my parents, um, my, my family came here as uh, refugees when I was two years old. Um, and, you know, they, my parents embraced radical change to come here and, you know, displayed a, a, a certain level of courage. And I feel, I always kind of look at that um, when I'm, doing all these endeavors and in my history playing the violin, you know, I, I try to have courage and try to embrace radical change. Um, and the way I got started with violin, um, so I, as I said, I played piano from a young age and I was singing kind of songs from a very young age, according to my mother. Um, and then I got really into playing the guitar when I was kind of a young teenager. And, um, then just ver various random sort of events happened, and um, I wanted to become a professional pianist um, because I, I saw this film. You might, you might have seen it, The Pianist, Roman Polanski's film. Of course, yeah. Of course. Very famous, yeah. very famous movie. Yeah, yeah, and, you know, it's, it was very inspiring to me, and I remember seeing it, and I said, I want to be a pianist, you know. I had stopped taking lessons very seriously, but you know, I had some, some foundation and anyway, so we started looking for teachers and um, they all wanted me to play scales and I wanted to play Chopin. So uh, right. one, one teacher after the other. And you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I was a very intuitive learner. Um, I, guess, I guess I still am. I, I like to learn by ear and then kind of supplement it with all of the requisite sort of uh, techniques. Anyway, so we, we cycled through some teachers and eventually we found one teacher and she brought a violin with her once because she teaches both and just, she had a violin lesson, I guess. And uh, I tried it just for fun. And she told me I'm a violinist now. And she gave wow. me her violin. <laughs> yeah, she gave me her violin. She's a wonderful woman, uh, Ala Danichkina is her name. And um, yeah, and it happened very fast and I just started picking it up rather quickly and after a few months I was you know playing proper proper music and luckily found a, a, a teacher who uh, a family uh, Ilya and Olga Kaller um, Ilya who's a, kind of a, one of the more famous violinists in the world who was already one of my heroes by that time and they agreed to uh, to teach me and then conservatory and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. so that's kind of the beginning. Um, well, you have, you've had great mentors. I mean, for those of you who don't know, Ilya Kaller is one of the few violinists who has won the three major competitions in the world. Is that right? If I'm not mistaken. That, yes, yes. 
Yeah. So he, if you don't know who Ilya Collar is, search him up because he is a phenomenal, phenomenal violinist. Yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate to have, um, I studied with him privately and I, I was fortunate to have a number of lessons that, you know, and then just always being around that sound and, uh, yeah, anyone who's interested should check out his Isai Sonatas because that recording is, is quite wonderful and, um, his Bach sonatas and partitas are, are quite amazing. They're like yeah. staple, staple recordings that everyone should know about. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, he, he recorded a lot of concertos, but I, I really like his playing in, in short pieces, you know, he, cause he has this, he carries this tradition of the Chrysler style and you mm -hmm. know, I picked that up from him um, to the best of my abilities. And, you know, he, He's a very important voice, I think, in the violin world because he carries these um, traditions with him. So, so you st so you definitely do have a very untraditional background in violin. You started very late. You said sixteen yeah. years old. Yeah, 16. yeah, that's incredibly late. So I I'm curious to know wh um, what it felt like playing catch up because it probably by the time you started violin playing and. By the time you decided to go into conservatory, you didn't have that much time, although you did have some musical training and some musical background with the piano. So can you share your thoughts on that for someone who's listening and be like, oh, my God, it's already too late. I, sh I shouldn't start because it's too late. Well, it probably is. But <laughs> 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 I mean, it, it, it happened, you know, it was kind of a love affair and, you know, you fall in love and you can live a year in a minute or something like that and I, I felt like that with the violin from my recollection in those early years kind of just all day playing and just not really thinking about sort, sort of realistic things that I was hearing from people and you know it, it, it's hard to balance that and kind of have that necessary realistic approach and I kind of came up against the wall um, several times in my in my career so far um, kind of realizing that oh I'm not where I need to be and you know always trying to get to that to that next level and um, building something that I that I feel is you know could be unshakable um, to some degree and I guess for anyone who's starting late it's you know it, it's not anyone's place to tell you you can or can't do it um, and many will say you can't and you ultimately have to look inside yourself and if you have passion and you know some talent and hard work and all those things you know nature nature takes its course I guess I don't know <laughs> no I, I love what you said and I think what you're tapping into is just that self perseverance and just wanting to uh, simply play the violin enjoy the violin because you want to and if somebody's telling you that you can't do it then you know screw them <laughs> and and you can just do it on your own and that's just a testament that you can start at any age um you're not too young or you're not too late to start the instrument and you know your story is a testament to that so do you think you have you had an advantage by starting so late if you were to just mm. like compare to other violinists who started very young do you think you have you know, starting at a very late age, you had some kind of advantage that not many other violinists have. Be because my my guess is that you have to solve problems very quickly um, in a in a short amount of time. So I'm curious to know your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly some advantages and some disadvantages. Um, I, I I mean, obvious disadvantages being that you know we learn certain things very quickly when we're kids. Yeah, like perfect pitch is, uh, from what I understand, you know, you have about a year from when you're born to, if you have that capacity to kind of, for someone to develop it uh, so that it becomes something useful and productive. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are certain advantages. Like I remember how I learned. So I feel like I'm able to be more useful as a teacher um, because I remember how I learned and I, I, kind of had a more intelligent approach to playing and I like doing things myself and you know I'm a little bit stubborn so I, I liked figuring things out and experimenting and you know I still do that to this day and I feel like that starting point 
you know, as opposed to, let's say I started when I was very young and had okay training, like who knows if you're lucky enough to have great training. Um, and then you don't know, you know, you, you follow a teacher and ho there's a lot of faith in, in your elders when you're young. Um, and I liked that ability to kind of take it into my own hands and nobody forced me and you know I'm very lucky my parents were encouraging but they're not musicians so there was another disadvantage I mean I didn't know anything about the industry um, so there are pros pros and cons and yeah it's every, everyone's case will be different but and you know what you just described is a typical mindset of an entrepreneur because for to me entrepreneurship is also you know you you know you could build a business and build capital and create a business for yourself right but you know the entrepreneurial mindset is finding solutions to problems yeah. and finding solutions to problems that are easily accessible or easily to grab for everyone else because you mm. you're trying to provide um, a solution to everyone not just like a specific group of people so i just love that mentality um, you said you were a teacher and you're also a pedagogue and you also do some some writing and research on musical performances. Can you talk to us about how that kind of came into your life, teaching and all the scholarship and the research you do? Yeah, I mean, again, it started because of my love affair with violin. And, you know, I, the way I learned, I think, uh, primarily was following people that I admire and just trying to emulate them um, and trying to integrate something, some, some sort of magic that I feel in their, in their music making. And, you know, whether that's people like Heifetz or Chrysler or Enescu and cellists, Daniel Shafran and Glenn Gould. I mean, I have a lot of people that I admire for various reasons. And I learned so much by just trying to get into their, get under their skin for, for a moment. And after you do that enough with various people, you, you begin to understand where, your own identity, I think. And um, yeah, that's kind of where my research, if you call it research, started. It, it's kind of trying to understand style. And you know, for a long time, I was engulfed in that kind of old school style. And then I kind of changed and in recent years you know past 10 years or so I've been really focused on okay well what about like historically informed practice and what does that bring to the table and um, can I consolidate these different styles you know I, I studied Hindustani classical music for, for a little while I was kind of obsessed with it and just there's so many interesting parallels and like there are these uh, techniques in Hindustani playing, like on the violin, for example, called mind and gamak, and these ways of moving between notes. Um, and I found that there's this kind of shared need to weave something sublime in between notes that I saw in the, these kind of great old school violinists and, you know, Hindustani classical and, you know, not, not only Hindustani, but other cultures also uh, appreciate that that kind of thing. And so, I mean, I, I love finding connections, and one thing led me to another, and I love to research things. And you know, I'm not, I'm not like a scholar in, with university affiliation or something. But um, sure, of course, yeah. You just you you yeah. have topics that you're interested about. You research those topics, and then you try to share your experience with your students. Yeah, yeah. I like I like to read a lot. I like to write. Um, I think it's important to, to learn how to write and become a better writer, um, better communicator. And to the degree that that helps me teach and it helps me kind of get my ideas out there, um, yeah, that, that kind of really keeps me, uh, keeps me inspired. I always find that, you know, I'm also a teacher and a pedagogue, yeah. but uh, <clears throat> for me, I, you all, we always have to keep evolving to understand new ideas, new philosophies, totally. also kind of go with the times, right? And I think if even as teachers, if we're stuck in one place, then it's gonna, it's actually gonna do a disservice to our students, and we're not offering new ideas, new philosophies. So uh, 
talk about your teaching for uh, with us for a moment. What age groups do you teach? And I know that you have a violin intensive that's uh, hosted in Boston. So I'd love for you to talk about that and sure. what your goals are as a teacher are to your students. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I've had different kinds of teachers and like my lessons with, with Ilya, for example, he uh, he's very knowledgeable about everything and he can demonstrate everything. And um, that was very useful. Uh, and then my, my kind of, I guess, main mentor in, in Switzerland, uh, a guy named Rudolf Kuhlmann, who was a, a student of Heifetz, he was an still is an absolutely phenomenal violinist, but I hope he's not listening. Like he's not, <laughs> not a great teacher. Spill, spill, the, spill, the, <laughs> spill the beans, spill it. <laughs> yeah. He's not a great teacher. And I don't think he claims to be like this amazing teacher. And he has a very simple, he's a very, very sweet guy and you know, very gifted. And he doesn't really know how he does what he does. He's like, come on, like, why can't you do it? It's so easy to watch, you know, and some people yeah. suffered and like, at first I was frustrated, but then I realized like, this is actually how I learn. I learn by watching and I learn by kind of copying and then making it my own and then seeing how it compares with other things I know. So, you know, having that background, what I try to do as a teacher, first and foremost, is try to improve on deficits that I saw in my own teachers, no matter how great they were and whatever, whatever they were doing. Um, so, you know, that could mean being more analytical and being more personal with my approach, um, trying to give people kind of a track through through which they can progress. Like I, I research a lot of on um, like violin treatises and technique books and like I feel like I've gone through everything and I'm writing some of my own. So I try to have material at hand that can be useful and then combine that with the most important element, which is like how to play something. You know, you can have all these great exercises, but if you don't know what the goal is and what you're supposed to feel. And so, you know, that's kind of the more pedagogical side. But I guess in a general sense, I, I feel like I want to inspire somebody to go out and, you know, research for themselves what interests them. And I feel like that that's a very important thing as a teacher, not to necessarily impose things, but rather inspire people because if people have hard work and talent and if they can have some inspiration then they, they can do so much and kind of uh, develop themselves so much and you kind of push them in the right direction and that's a dynamic I really like um, I teach um, people uh, mostly like from teenagers up mm -hmm. and um, I, I do a lot of I've been doing a lot of online lessons you know many years back. And then when COVID hit, I was like, I was like, finally, you're all getting on, on the bandwagon. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah, to, to be honest, it's been uh, at first, it was kind of like, a, it was definitely a, a total shift in mindset yeah. and how I how I teach as well. But right. luckily, I had all the equipment and I had to, you know, add a couple of things, of course, but I think we're all ad pretty much adapted um, at this point. But you think so? Well, I think not, not entirely. Like I know that God knows how long this is going to take, right? Uh, how right. long this pandemic is going to happen right now. As of this taping, we're still going through the COVID-19 pandemic. For all of you trying, trying to catch up on your violin podcast episodes. And if you haven't done so already, please subscribe. Please, please, please. I would really appreciate it. It helps the podcast it. out. <laughs> but uh, I know that there are many there are many schools right now who are debating on like kind of like a hybrid model where you have three weeks online, one week in person, because I think, um, I think there was some kind of article in the new England, um, journal of medicine or something that for, um, like of pediat like pedi pedi pediatric doctors still encourage that young students still have some kind of in-person interaction. So I, I'm, I'm curious to know how that's going to shape the way we teach music and the way we perform music. I know that there's a lot of, there's a lot more screen time these days. We're doing a lot more Facebook yeah, as it, watching. As we didn't and, have enough of that before, right? And yeah, exactly, right? And now we have like maybe double or triple the amount now. It's but life, yeah. it's our whole life, yeah. So I'm, I'm 
if you're curious and if you want to join the conversation, leave your comments down below and we'd love to answer them in the, ne in the next uh, podcast episode. Hopefully we can have Daniel back to, you know, answer those burning questions. But you have uh, made a lot of great points, Daniel. You talked about, uh, very simply put, not all great players are good teachers, right? Mm -hmm. Not all great teachers. Not all great players are good teachers and vice versa, um, you know, and I think for to me, I learned the way you you learned. I, I'm also a very visual person. So if I see someone do something very different, I'm like, oh, maybe I should try that in the practice room. Mm -hmm. And that leads me to my next point where you always want to make sure you're coming into the practice room curious with new ideas. And that is one good practice technique that everybody can implement today after this podcast. If you're looking at a piece of music, like whether it's Suzuki, whether it's Brahms violin concerto, have ideas because that's what kind of inspires you to even do more. And then if that idea that if that idea works, then you're like, oh my God, that's awesome. Let me try some more ideas. And then you kind of go into this, uh, to this black hole of ideas and you just keep trying and trying and trying. But well, uh, our, our, um, our field is very kind of, it's steeped in tradition and it's steeped in tradition amidst, a, you know, a modern world. And there, there's some conflicts there, even on the psychological level. Sure. It's like in, in many other fields, it's, it's, it's natural to kind of um, have ideas and, and like be forward thinking and innovation and, you know, if, if you're, if you follow tech, it, it's just, it's all about innovating. Even, you know, some people go too far in that mindset and, you know, people are throwing money, billions of dollar investments in apps that don't do anything. Right. But, <laughs> you know, but, so, but there's that energy and like in our field, it's, it's very steeped in tradition. I get, obviously people are doing new things, but psychologically it's like this teacher student relationship. Sometimes it causes students to kind of, um, the, the sense of loyalty and the sense of kind of respect for your teacher, um, if, let's say, unchecked, it could lead to kind of a lack of experimenting, a lack of, of course, it depends. Some teachers will encourage that, but other teachers won't. And it's, you know, there, there are some teachers, it's like, here's how I do it. Here's my way. And you could take it or you can leave it. And people... Right, yeah. You know, so it's... And I think sometimes that's also a disservice because let's say, you know, you have your specific way of teaching. I have my specific way of teaching, but, you know, we have the same student, right? Yeah. Like a um, very clear example is that I have one student. Well, I, uh, just to be clear, I teach with a shoulder rest. You know, all my students normally wear shoulder rest, but there's this one student who says, you know what? I don't really care for the shoulder rest and I actually feel comfortable without one. I'm and jealous. Yeah. Yeah. I applaud her. She's, she's a trooper. And, and to me, I'm like, okay, well, let's try it. You know, I'm always about trying things. Yeah. And if it works, if it works for the student, then great. Amazing. But, you know, don't expect that same thing to work on another student. Violin is, I mean, music is a laboratory. I think doing, doing anything very in depth and devoting yourself to something. I mean, it's, you're really, you're learning about yourself in the process and there, there's no formula formulaic way to do that so yeah experimenting getting ideas getting inspired and so that yeah totally it's also the entrepreneurial mindset and i do want to talk to you about you know the businesses that you've started and yeah. because entrepreneurship is about trial and error and it's a lot of failure in the process as i'm sure you know um i want to talk to you about your your engagement with Overtone Artists and Spice Classics and how you were involved with those and how you started those endeavors. Because as far as I understand, you're running, you know, private violin studio, you're also running a music label, and you're also running like an artist professional services agency. So you're doing all three at the same time, right? And I'm sure they're all scattered with, within your schedule, right? But I'm curious to know how you get how you got started with those and how did the idea come about to start those companies? Yeah. Um, so Spice Classics is a kind of an offshoot that I started of a, there's a jazz label that a friend of mine runs. And so I, uh, I thought it would be interesting to kind of, I like to curate and that's something I've done. That's how I started my YouTube channel is like, I used to collect 
uh, rare recordings of like the artists that I love, and I would post them. And you know, I, that was that was a, a nice way to start my channel, which has grown since then. And you know, another way to curate is to kind of, if you're able to, to uh, provide opportunities for people to record albums. Um, and the, the way it started is, you know, I wanted to release something of mine that I, you know, I just wanted to get out there and I was, you know, proud of the work that I'd done with, with uh, my collaborator, Constantine. Um, so it was my, my first CD. We recorded uh, Brahms' second violin sonata and then a, a bunch of uh, short pieces and some Prokofiev suite. And so, yeah, I mean, it's not like a giant record uh, label operation, but um, just gradually growing and um, I like to help uh, my friends who I admire as musicians uh, release things and we're trying to get into like presto classical and you know take it to the next level with, in terms of distribution and you never know spice classics might be the next deca so stay tuned in a few well, years well the problem is if it, <laughs> problems if you google spice classics you get a lot of spice mixes spice mix <laughs> okay <laughs> which is probably well, which is probably you know better you know? maybe this is a great rebranding opportunity <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You never know. No, it's, yeah, and then, okay, so Overtone Artists, it's, it's, it's something I've been really interested in is like uh, audio and video engineering, and um, I, I like to make little films um, of artists. And uh, again, a lot of these things came from a need, a need and a want to do it for my own purposes um, and not having any connections and not having just money I could just throw at things. Um, yeah, I like learning things, and so I learned all that stuff, and then I saw that it could be useful to others, and so mm -hmm. that's, um, yeah, those are, those are fun projects. Yeah, and of course, what you're getting at is a lot of, a lot of us do a lot of self-promotion, right? And yeah. sometimes we do need a little help because there's so much out there now. There's social media, yeah. there are... You know, you have to release an album, you have to get a professional headshot, a website, good bio, um, everything, right? And sometimes it can be overwhelming. So that is uh, the beauty of what you're doing is, you know, you're filling, a, you're filling a need to a lot of people. And again, you're solving a solution for many, for many artists out there to help you, um, to help them grow. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things I want to do is, I mean, with the Recently, I've started this YouTube channel and I'm making all these videos. Um, and part of that is I want to make some videos on production. And, you know, I, I get a lot of questions on my videos like, you know, how did you make a video, or lighting, and, you know, stuff that you probably. Get some, as well. like, not even like violin related, right? <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah, well, it's musicians that maybe they want to do their own thing and they want to, like, you know, make, to make some content. And, sure. Um, yeah, that's. It. it I, I appreciate it a lot because I think we live in a time when kind of the archival nature of creating something is slowly going away. Like it's all about stories and things that disappear in a day. And like, that's the hottest thing. And, you know, you go from one social media platform to the next and each new one is less archival than the next. It's all about some like um, momentary sugar rush that's, you know, you, you only need 140 characters for. and. You know, I like this idea of creating a product because because what what I do as a musician, what we do as musicians, it's we, we we play with time. You know, a performance is a, is is a temporary thing. It's you know, it's hard to kind of as opposed to someone who's like building furniture and like they have something to show for it. We have time to show for it. Like we played a concert, it's over. So I'm always looking for ways to kind of um, create something that that is archival, that is. Um, um, physical in nature and so yeah and i think that's the beauty of live performance too because you're in the moment and right. you know you're you're working with time with you know you're dealing with time in very certain ways and i mean all music is just organized sound and then if you have people sit in the audience and you let them forget about their everyday worries mm -hmm. and you just let them focus it's it's, it's something surreal like there's just many muse there are many musical pieces out there, at least for me, where I, I could be listening to something for hours on end and I'd be like, oh my gosh, it's the evening, right? That's the crazy thing. It's like, you know, you could be listening to something for 
maybe 40 minutes, but it could last, but it could feel like five minutes, like in a, in a concert hall, you know? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, and that's, that's such a fascinating thing to me. Like, why do people listen to hour long symphonies? And why do they, why do they stand in the museum and gaze in ignorance and wonder at these kind of old things? And, you know, and there, there's a certain inexhaustible and infinitely renewable quality to, to music and to art. And, um, yeah. And, and as you said, you know, that there's this quality of performing that, you know, something that's in the moment. And I, what I'm trying to do a lot of the time is to balance the need for sort of a material creation um, and, um, you know, perception with audience, connection with audience and, you know, that, that whole thing. And they're two totally different things. And I feel like I need both. So it, it's, it's, yeah, it's challenging. Yeah, we're always, stri we're always striving for connection yeah. Even as just as people, you know, right now, as we're staying isolated and we're trying to stay smart about COVID-19, we're trying to create this community. We're trying to we're, we're actually longing for this connection with people, yeah. you know, in person. Right. And I think music does just that. And well, I'm, a speaking, very, I'm, a, I'm a pessimist here. Sorry to interrupt. You're a pessimist. Yeah. OK, well, well let's actually <laughs> let's start the conversation, though. Then, like, why? Why are you a pessimist? And in terms of that? Well, like. I mean, what you said is correct, but you know, what are we, what are we telling ourselves right now that, you know, is going to replace what we're losing, you know, because of COVID? Like, how many people actually believe that the online thing can really? Like, I see my friends all the time, like sometimes fantastic musicians, playing live concerts in their living room using a potato to record it. And like, <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, I can't. Like, I can't. I just maybe me as a violinist, like I can watch them and like I'm a nerd and like I can nerd out as a violin. But like, how do you have a transcendental experience? Like, how is that at all going to replace the live um, thing? So and n not to mention, they're all doing it for free, which is like that's that's wonderful sharing. But like musicians already have a hard time monetizing creativity. And it's like instead we should be trying to find a way to provide more quality and some people are doing this obviously more quality and like the best experience possible and yes you know people if they so desire should pay something for that as they would for a concert so right but do you th but do you think that's a problem particular in this country i mean you find many other countries that support the arts i mean recently the uk just passed a 1.6 billion pound uh, bill to help support the arts so that way musicians yeah. and orchestras don't lose their jobs, right? So I think the priorities in terms of arts education in general is different in the United mm -hmm. States. And um, if you're listening from abroad, if you're listening in another country, drop comments down below because um, we need to start this conversation in terms of arts education and the importance of arts education. So I think you're absolutely right that there are many artists who embrace the digital medium, who have built online communities like on YouTube and, you know, people drop and artists drop, you know, a new music video every month. Right. And that's their niche. That's their specialty. And then actually, and as a matter of fact, that performance outside the digital medium could become secondary to them because of the, because of the growing presence they made online. Two set violin is a perfect example of that. Right. They made yeah, YouTube well, you videos. Know, they, they, they do some pretty successful tours. Yeah, I know. Yeah, two set. If you're watch, if you're watching and listening, I know that there are some listeners in Australia. If it's two set violin, I want to interview you guys. So, so I know that yeah. for a fact. But, but, but two set is a, isn't a perfect example of that. Sure. So absolutely. But let's. But anyways, this is an ongoing conversation. We have no answers. We're just we're just riffing and we're talking right now. But it's a it's a community. Community is important, especially in music. And you've built a YouTube community with over 70,000 subscribers to your YouTube channel. And, um, is it you know, you, I don't think it's that much. Is it that is I, or, okay. Well, if I misstated then, oh, well, but I'm anyways, sure, it's sure a lot. It'll get there soon. <laughs> it's My a goal. lot. It's a lot. It's a lot of subscribers in the thousands anyways, but you have this large following on YouTube and you're providing a lot of good value. You're providing solutions to a lot of um, you know, 
of a lot of violin problems like shifting, vibrato, intonation. Um, I watched your shifting video the other day and I'm really going to send that video to my students. So you, so you have this YouTube following now and what is your goal with your YouTube community? You know, you're providing videos for a lot of people and you're providing a lot of value, but what is the goal for you? Hmm. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing negotiation what the actual goal is. I mean, it started with like, I, I've been working on a couple of books that I, I want to release eventually, like one on left hand technique and one on, um, on ways of practicing. And, you know, I, I think there is this kind of misconception about hoarding ideas that I was under that like, you know, I want to save my ideas for the right moment where when I release them, they can, I, I can acquire the maximum amount of status from them or, or some, some nonsense like that. And what, yeah. what, what I realized is that, you know, it's good to just get ideas out there and bounce them off people. And I realized that like, it's amazing. Like I get comments on my YouTube videos from people that are so knowledgeable and like, um, you know, I, I learn a lot from, from some of these comments and just random people. And so it's, it started as kind of an idea for a book and it's still happening. But then I was like, okay, why don't I put my uh, production skills to use and make these videos? Because until that point, my channel had been my performances and um, this curated stuff. And like I, I was very reticent to kind of have this personal, like my face on the YouTube channel Hey, it's me, everyone. Hey, guys, subscribe I think, here. <laughs> right, I know. I think, um, you know, I started my personal YouTube channel outside of the Violin Podcast, and I feel, I understand exactly what you feel because we're, at this point, we're so comfortable performing in front of people, right? But then the moment you have to talk, you know, we're comfortable playing, but then well, the moment not, we show our face and talk. It's not even talking like I like to talk, but <laughs> just kind of, I didn't, I didn't want to be seen as kind of, somebody that's trying to create some cult of personality and then right I realized sure. that those those fears or whatever were all kind of irrational and you know people like a face when they're if that face is saying something and doing something that's interesting and etc cetera, etc cetera. so i got over that for the most part and you know I'm, I'm really enjoying making these videos and i i basically saw like if you ask what the goal is like i want I want to look at someone like Simon Fisher and try to create material that's like on that level of kind of detail and quality. And then combined with, you know, good playing as, as, as well as I can manage combined with good production. And I found that those three elements are not really there on YouTube. Um, some people are doing some of them. Um, and you know, you have different, different people doing different things, but, I felt like there was a space for me to 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 get in there and and try to make some content and you know the the, the reaction's been positive and I, I I really enjoy the enjoy the process so yeah and we all know YouTube is a is a long term endeavor right to actually yeah. find success on YouTube I mean you you probably started your YouTube channel many years 15 ago fifteen years ago fifteen years ago. Yeah, exactly. Right. Just like when it kind of came out. <laughs> or, yeah, I was on that really quickly and, you know, I was posting recordings and stuff and yeah, yeah right. And um, so. yeah, and of course, you know, video, of course, we, we talk about, you know, like video is a new blogging in many yeah, ways. Right. Totally. So like video is a lot easier to capture and it's also, you know, YouTube is the second largest search engine in the world. So mm -hmm. if, you know, so because YouTube is technically owned by Google, so their algorithms are constantly changing and it's all that stuff. But to find an answer on YouTube, you know, like this violin podcast is the exact same idea as what you're trying to do with your YouTube videos. It's kind of the interview. There, there are like interviews out there, but the moment I realized that there was no violin podcast, I'm like, oh my gosh, totally. why isn't there something like this? So yeah. it's just a podcast, just a talk to violence about violin, and then maybe some stuff about like the tea. Like, by the way, what kind of tea are you drinking? Because I, I saw you with your cup. And for those of you who are watching on YouTube, and if the, for those of you who are listening on the podcast, jump on the YouTube link in the podcast description below. And check out what uh so yeah so what kind of uh, tea are you drinking right now so um 
I, I should give a plug to one of my other endeavors. So I import Japanese tea and uh, olive oil from Spain. So what? So so things. what? So what are you bad at, Daniel? <laughs> <laughs> um, drawing, and really drawing, okay. and like probably a million other things. All right, good. Um, I've al I always say to people that I'm I'm bad at skydiving. <laughs> yeah, so, well, I, I think I don't know. I've gone you, once, but I don't know if you're that bad. I think to be bad at skydiving that means you're not gonna have a second chance. That's right. Yeah, you're here, so that means you're good at it. That that means uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I don't do solo dives, but <laughs> anyway, so. So you have okay. So that that's a that's a great leeway to hobbies outside of violin and outside of music, right? Because for right. us to say sane, you know, a lot of a lot of people out there thinking that us violinists and us musicians are always thinking about violin twenty four seven. But know. you are, yeah. Well, of course. I mean, you <laughs> and I are. But there are some people out there. Like for me, golf has been like a recent endeavor of mine. Like like you with with olive oil, but at the same time, you know, we we there there is something to be said about kind of taking your time away from your instrument to kind of think about bigger ideas and Definitely. to kind of live the life a little bit. And yeah, talk about those endeavors. Talk about your olive oil. Talk about your imported teas because I might I might just order them from you. <laughs> yeah, they're on they're on Amazon. They're on fine Amazon web pages. Oh okay. Um, yeah. Well, what do I do out of? I mean, I like to hang out with my wife. It's, well, that's that's always a plus. I do. I like to hang out with my wife too. Yeah. Do you have like? A, do you like have any favorite foods that you cook with your wife, or are you are you a she's cook? She's an amazing, or? amazing cook. So she's like, she just gets on something and then she like perfects it. So what? It's like this month is Ethiopian, next month is like something else, and you know she demands that she <laughs> from herself that she makes it as good as a restaurant. So. I have to say I'm a, a very lucky recipient of, of those efforts. Um, is, is your wife a, a, a musician also or? No, no, no. She's, um, she teaches at Harvard. She's, um, teaches writing. Um, Wonderful. Yeah. So I, my, my, my wife is also uh, a big cook. She has like an amazing like food palette, like much more refined than mine but you know the moment i married her i showed her like what i eat and then she goes uh-uh but you're never mm. eating this again <laughs> so like yeah it's a lot of um a lot of asian cuisine and uh she's a pianist so we always compare nice. like food to to music because in many ways like we're always trying to get those flavors out of music can i tell you something yeah oh, i'm that's, that's that's your next thing you and your wife music and food blog slash video series uh yeah Do see but but but, there, but there's a downside to that because there's an organization called music for food and i think there right. there there might be there might be a little bit of a discrepancy and copyright infringement there but we'll see <laughs> but um yeah that's sure a great that, idea sure they're gonna come right after you yeah i've always had this idea of uh doing a youtube series called to the gig where I'm always mm. driving to a gig with someone in the car and I just record my conversation in the car. That's brilliant. Yeah, but- it's like comedians in cars getting coffee. Exactly. It's like- Except they're actually going somewhere. Ex except they're actually going to get coffee somewhere. I mean, <laughs> and in this case, we're actually going to the gig, but- And then uh, you also record the car ride home where everyone's just kind of upset about how- <laughs> Yeah, we'll do like a time, lap time lapse of the gig and then we'll just be That's like, right. And the entire watch, 20, that. the entire part two of that car ride home will just be like 20 minutes of silence. And that'll be the end of the episode uh, <laughs> because we're also exhausted totally after a gig. But uh, anyways, Daniel, uh, I like to ask this question as a yeah. kind of like a final thought for the interview. Um, what do you have to say to any violinist out there who is kind of maybe lacking motivation during this time or feels like they're in a rut and they're thinking about, maybe giving up the violin uh, either professionally or as a hobby. Um, can you share some encouraging thoughts on, on life as a musician and how the violin can kind of improve our lives? Wow. That's a, that's a big question. Um, yeah. When people are in, <laughs> I have this funny thing that I, that I, I, I compiled for when I'm in an artistic rut. Um, there's this guy, uh, I forgot his first name, Enno, who created these things called Oblique Strategies. It's like hmm. these flashcards that help musicians when they're in the recording studio if they're like in a rut. And like you just pick a random flashcard and it's supposed to kind of, you know, jolt your mind into a different mode and maybe get you out of a rut. Sure, yeah. Um, 
so it's like funny things like you know mystical things like uh, only one element of each kind and you're supposed to just interpret that with whatever you're trying to do and anyway so that's like i guess the last resort um <laughs> but yeah for people in a rut i mean like i always think of um i always think of beethoven like you probably know this like beethoven was one of the first in the kind of sell your music directly to publishers game right he like skipped the high courts he and it was just completely uh revolutionary oh speaking of my wife there she is <laughs> <laughs> i'll edit um, that out <laughs> no no that's fine keep it in keep it in okay <laughs> yeah so i think we live in a very privileged time in terms of new possibilities so um, I, I run a seminar sometimes in, in universities um, and I call it the modern musician where I go through like all these tools that I've kind of come across that help me do new things and just kind of act on ideas and just play things out because I think a lot of people have ideas but they don't like the ideas just sit there and whether it's in like in a, a lack of inertia or it's like people think that they should be someone should see their ideas and reward them immediately <laughs> you know, mm. so arming yourself with the resources to kind of act on your ideas and try things out. Um, and in terms of music and violin, like I had a lot of concerts canceled, as, as I'm sure you did, and some that I was very much looking forward to. And, you know, I was sitting there and I'm like, okay, I can practice the things that I'll practice, but I don't have any concerts coming up. And what I did was, um, I did these collaborative recordings with my, uh, my, my musical partner, Constantine, and, you know, like we did the Brahms Sonata, and we kind of figured out a way that we can do it so that it's musical and it's not just like there's no click track or anything. And we're actually releasing a Brahms B major trio soon. We've been doing that with our, our friend. Um, so, like, fun projects like that where, you know, there's an interesting musical interaction that's outside of the norm. Um, yeah, I don't know. Everyone, I think, has a chance now because there's no FOMO, you know? There's no... It, there's no it, more FOMO. Yeah, fear of missing out. Your, you can't look at your neighbor and be like, you know, envious, at least not too much because they're not doing anything anyway. <laughs> so you can really, right. maybe, maybe that's a freeing sort of thing that like you can be free if you're, you know, you're God willing, have your health and, and everything. And um, So I, I tried, that's my, that's my optimism. That's awesome, Daniel. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Kurganoff, violinist, pedagogue, and entrepreneur. Um, I'll leave links to Daniel's websites um, in the description below. Please make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and also leave your comments on what was your favorite part of the interview because we want to hear from you. We want to create this awesome community with violinists and even classical musicians worldwide. You know, we want to make this um, a conversation starter and maybe bounce some new ideas off. So ladies and gentlemen, Daniel Kurganoff and Daniel, we hope to have you on um, for a future episode, hopefully in person. <laughs> Yeah, it was a pleasure. Let's do it. Mm -hmm.